into the wild. So if you had just had the most powerful encounter you've ever had with God, what would you do? Where would you go? How would you respond to that encounter with the Holy, with God? And what would you do if God at that moment had said to you, you are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. What would you do with those words? How would they make you feel? How would you respond? Jesus went into the wild. Jesus went into the wilderness because he needed to know what those words meant. How would he live out those words in that encounter with God that said, you are my beloved. You are my son. With you I am well pleased. How would he live out what that mission meant? And so he went into the wild. He went into the wild into the wilderness. And why would he go there? Why would he go into the wilderness for 40 days? Matthew wants to remind us that going into the wilderness for 40 days is an important part of our spiritual journey. To go into the wilderness for 40 days is what happened to Noah and his family. They were on that boat, and it rained, and it poured, and it rained, and it poured, and for 40 days, they were on that boat. For 40 days, after Moses had freed the Israelites from Egypt, for 40 days, when God was speaking to him about the law, about how the Israelites should live, following God. He spent 40 days at the top of the mountain with God. 40 days writing down all that God had to teach him about how the Israelites should live and be a community to each other. For 40 days, Elijah was in the wilderness. As he was figuring out where he would go next, what he would do next. For 40 days, he was there in the wilderness. So when we read that Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, we put him in that same spot, right? In that same story pattern of wilderness wandering. I forgot the most important 40. For 40 years, the Israelites wandered. They wandered for 40 years in a space where they should have been able to make it to the promised land in a week or so, right? But it took them 40 years because they weren't ready to get across that river. And so when Jesus goes into the wilderness, we remember all those 40s. We remember that for everyone, the 40 has been an important symbol. It has been an important time of preparation. It has been a time when he centered himself and got ready. And so for 40 days, he struggled in the wilderness. And after the 40 days, he came out and he was famished. Now at that point, Matthew changes the story. That's where it ends with Mark, and Mark, he just begins his ministry. In Matthew and Luke, the story changes at that moment. And Jesus encounters. So, here's the thing. There are four different words that the passage you read in the Bible uses for this person. Four different words. Which means it isn't who you're putting the image of that person as. Any image you have of who Satan would be is not the image that is in place in that scripture. 
because those words mean different things in that text. And mostly it says, him, the slanderous one, which sometimes they translate as the tempter. Sometimes they translate as temptation, and sometimes they translate as the devil. But it means him, the slanderous one. And so what is happening here is what happened to Job. When Hasatan, the accuser, one of the members of God's court, one of the angels that surrounds God, decided to test Job, Hasatan, the accuser, came down and did all sorts of horrible things to Job to push him in the, to the point where he would reject God, and he never did. That's the who we're talking about here. The accuser. The one who tempts Jesus to tempt whether he trusts God fully and completely. So it ends with the line, he's famished. And the first thing the tempter does is said, let me give you some bread. And Jesus, because he spent all that time alone with God, struggling with God, arguing with God, figuring out who he was going to be as the anointed one. He says you can't live by bread alone. And then the tempter says, well, if that doesn't work, I'm going to take you to the highest point and just drop you. Because he's trying to trust whether Jesus trusts God. And Jesus, again, responds with scripture, saying, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then, the tempter. The tempter tests him to see, are you going to be the anointed one we've been dreaming of? The one who comes with arms and armies? The one who frees us from the oppressor? The one who kicks out Rome and whatever oppressor we have and frees us? And Jesus again says no. He again says no. So when we practice Lent, the 40 days from Ash Wednesday through Easter Saturday, skipping Sundays, you know that, right? If you gave up something on Sundays, they're a skip day. Because it's a resurrection day, so you don't have to deprive yourself on a resurrection day. <laughs> Because they don't count in the 40 days. In Lent, we're just supposed to wrestle with those kind of questions. To wrestle with who Jesus is to us. How we follow Jesus in our life. How we'll let God into our life and guide us. We're to wrestle with it for those 40 days, struggling with how we will be we're to give up those things that push us away from God. So this year, for Lent, we're going to use the story of Matisse to help us walk through the wild. So I want to let, share a little bit about Matisse's story. He came from a small village in France that, as he would describe it, was gray and dull. Growing up in that face that was gray and dull, he was being pushed to become part of his family's store and business. And he had no interest in doing that until his family discover that maybe being a lawyer would be a good call 
So they got him to school studying the law, and he hated the law. He hated the boredom of reading all those cases and memorizing everything. And then he got very sick. He got appendicitis and had an operation. Now, this is the late 1800s. That would not be a good time to have appendicitis and have an operation, right? All the things that we have, all the medicines that we have, all the cleanliness that we have would not be the same place that Matisse was getting that operation. And so he was very sick at home for a very long time. And in that time, his mother gave him some stuff to paint with, to color with. And when he started painting, his entire world started changing. And he thought he could become an artist. And his parents thought, oh no, he's never going to have enough money to live. We're going to support this kid for the rest of our lives. But he went ahead anyway. And he went to Paris to try to enroll in one of the best art schools there is. But at that time, in order to get into the art school, you had to find someone who would sponsor you. And the way you found your sponsor is they would set you in front of a painting of one of the masters, like at the Louvre, and say, copy it exactly. And Matisse always had a problem with that, the exactly part of it. So he never passed measure, because his painting never looked exactly like what was being painted, until he came across a different mentor. And this mentor said to him and the students that were gathered around him, when you look at that painting, what I want you to paint is the feelings you're experiencing because of the painting. And that began to change how Matisse painted, how he saw the world. <clears throat> so if you look at some of those paintings, I gave you a whole page of them. What you'll see is he can paint paintings that look like real life, right? And then, hey Jerry, can you show the slide of woman in the hat? Right, I'm standing in front of it, so I'll move to this side. So, what color is Madame Matisse wearing when he painted her? Black. Yes, she was dressed all in black. There was no color on her at all when, he was, when she was sitting before him to be painted. And this is what came out, what he was feeling. Now, I wonder about that, because, like, really painting your wife's face green? Come on. But he began a different style of painting, a style of painting that changed how the world started to look at what could be possible. Because at this time, people who were painting, if they weren't painting realistic landscapes, they had moved into the Impressionist phase, which, while different, right, it's not completely realistic. When you look at it, you, get a, you know exactly what they're painting, right? It's close enough. It's just little points of dot, right? Matisse said when he looked at those paintings, that's not what I see, what I feel, what I'm experiencing. And he wanted to bring out the brightness. Like, so if you look at, and Monet is one of my favorites, so as a counterpoint to Matisse. Monet will paint the same scene, and in each one, it's very sort of mild, right? It's very calming and soothing, even though that you see that same bridge. It will have different light at different points of the day. So I think he has 12 prints of the same bridge. Each one slightly different, but all kind of muted. Matisse came along and said, why do you never use fire orange red, you know? Why do you never use the bright colors of the earth? Why do you never make it stand out? 
And so, Jerry, on the next slide. All right, now I'm on the wrong side again. On this one, this is the view outside his window when he lived, moved to the south of France. Um, the city of Coyer, which is also that, by the way, which is to show you that he paints very differently depending on his mood. In this, you can see the light just popping, right? Like the spaces where he didn't put paint, masters, right? The people he was supposed to be copying would have covered all the white. But the way he painted allowed the white to bring the brightness of the colors out. Matisse wanted people to feel what he saw. And when he looked out at the city before him, he felt brightness and hope and lightness. Matisse teaches us that when we jump into the wild, when we go into the wilderness places, we need to have eyes that are different than what we normally take with us. We need to have eyes that will be open to see something that is beautiful and rare and exciting. Something that moves us. Because often, even when we jump into the wilderness, we forget to look. Like how many of you right now, because see, I'm still new to California, so everything is like spectacular to me. There are succulents right now that have like a triangle flower. How many of you notice them when you're walking? That triangle flower. Or there's one over on the street over from your guys' house, or maybe it's your street, that sent up a six foot tall, and it's gonna flower soon. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen because flowers in Illinois never send up a six foot tall flower. <clears throat> when you're outside, do you notice that spectacular nature, that beauty? And when you notice it, do you experience the presence of God? Do you experience the wonder that is what God has created in this world? I mean, how many of you, when you saw snow on Mission Peak for the first time in however many years, got that little glimmer of excitement that children get, right? Because it's not something you normally see. It's not something you normally experience. To see those images of the coyote walking through the snow on Mission Peak. This Lent, we're to open ourselves to that wonder, to that possibility and hope, to be open to the wildness that we can experience, the amazing colors that can inspire us and fill us. That's why I gave you all that little pad of paper to jot down those moments, whether you can color them or like me, you aren't really good at coloring, you could write them in words or you can try to color because you could paint like Matisse, right? Look, you all can do that. I know you can. It's possible. And I want you to experience this Lent as a time to open your eyes, to open your eyes to the possibilities and the beauty and the wonder that God has placed before us and around us and in us. Amen.